Thank you. The Senate Capital Investment Committee will come to order. It's Thursday, March 30th at 3 p.m. Um, uh, first of all, I want to just give a warm welcome to all my relatives who are here in the room with us today, and very happy to have you here to present your proposals before the, the Senate Capital Investment Committee. And we're starting out with um, Senate File 2009, which has multiple provisions, so we're looking forward to hearing about each of them. And Senator Kunish is doing her own bill today, so she can't join us, but Senator Dibble has uh, generously welcome to uh, sit in in her place. And Senator Dibble, do you have some opening comments? Uh, thank you so much, Madam Chair. Yes, I'm very honored to be able to represent Senator Kunish um, and her sponsorship and authorship of Senate File 2009, uh, which is uh, a whole range of uh, initiatives and projects uh, unified under one cover. Um, the Urban Indigenous Legacy Initiative which is Senate File 2009, is comprised of 16 organizations located in Minneapolis and St. Paul, serving thousands of Minnesotans from across the state. Uh, and they have done so for a number of decades. The organizations take a community approach to solving deep disparities in the indigenous community. Services provided are education, healthcare, jobs, training, housing, childcare, nutrition, uh, and the arts, and in other forms of enrichment. The buildings that we're going to hear about and discuss today are decades old and deteriorating. Closets have been made into exam rooms, buckets catch the rain coming in, and some are so old they don't meet all the fire codes but have been grandfathered. The total request is for $136.4 million already. Nearly $90 million has been raised from private donors, local government, and other sources. Um, and Madam Chair, with your indulgence, I just wanted to name the 16 organizations. Um, we have the Division of Indian Work, the Minnesota Indian w Women's Resource Center, Little Earth, New Native Theater, American Indian Community Development Center, McGeezy, Native American Community Clinic, American Indian OIC, Minneapolis American Indian Center, Native American Community Development Institute, Indigenous Peoples Task Force, Lower Phelan Creek Project, Interfaith Action of Greater St. Paul, Andayung Center, Montessori American Center, and American Indian Family Center. An impressive array of incredible organizations doing amazing work. Um, and with that, uh, Madam Chair, we have um, two testifiers who would like to lead off um, uh, and, and talk about the overarching uh, effort. And then I think we'll have some individuals come forward um, to talk about this initiative and their part of it. Thank you all again so much for joining us. And just because of the number of bills we have before the committee, we've had over 500 bills introduced. Um, we've, we're limiting you to three minutes. Um, hope that works out for you. So please go ahead. Who's going first to introduce yourself uh, to the committee? Thank you, Chair Pappas and committee members for allowing me this time today. My name is Marissa Miyakanta Cummings, and I'm the president and CEO of the Minnesota Indian Women's Resource Center and a citizen of the Omaha tribe. I will provide a brief overview of the Urban Indigenous Legacy Initiative collaboration, followed by my statement on MIWRC's project. The 16 American Indian culturally specific organizations represented on behalf of this bill exist as a result of the 1953 Federal Indian Termination and Relocation Acts. These acts systematically removed American Indian people from the reservation communities and relocated us to urban areas like Minneapolis and St. Paul. While American Indian urban people have tribal citizenship, we are also citizens of the United States, the state of Minnesota, and we are your constituents. Our community is historically underfunded and has the highest negative social determinants of health, including health care, education, workforce development, homelessness, poverty, and more. Our plan addresses all social determinants of health through a community-centered approach. Our organizations create an ecosystem of culturally specific support, and we need to holistically uplift the collaborative in order to drive the social impact for community. Today, you will hear about the impact statements and diligent fundraising efforts from each individual project. Safe and functioning buildings will allow us to increase the number of clients served, generate more jobs, and reverse the negative disparities that exist, all positively impacting the state of Minnesota. A social return on investment evaluates every dollar invested into resources and how that investment saves money down the line. We are here because we are interested in upstream solutions. 
We are a collaboration of educated and innovative leaders who have data to support the incredible work of our organizations and the positive impact we have on community. However, we need safe and functioning buildings to drive our social impact. Our mission at the Minnesota Indian Women's Resource Center is to empower Native women and families to exercise their cultural values with integrity and to achieve sustainable life ways while advocating for justice and equity. We are a mission-driven social impact organization that has a long-standing reputation in community. Our programs and services are culturally specific and developed to reflect the needs of families and community, which consists of three departments that work interconnectedly with one another. Our community engagement and impact programs programs include ICWA Kinship, Life Skills Parenting, and the Family Home Spirit Home Visiting programs, Housing Prevention, Section 8 Housing, and Traditional Birthing. Mental and Behavioral Health programs include Housing for Women Participating in Intensive Outpatient Treatment programs, a Peer Recovery program, Mental Health Therapy, and a Drop-In Center for the Unsheltered. Anti-gender-based violence programs include Safe Harbor, Sexual Assault Medical Advocacy and Survivor Groups, Domestic Violence Advocacy, and Anti-Sex Trafficking Advocacy and Support Groups, including Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women Family Supportive Services. We serve over 6,000 clients a year with a building that lacks functionality, comfort, safety, sustainability, and efficiency. A safe and functioning building will allow us to double our service delivery to clients, improve program outcomes, and grow our staff to increase the workforce in community. Phase one of our project is to renovate our Section 8 housing, which does not meet code due to being grandfathered in as an existing building. We have raised $13.1 million for this project from the following sources. Affordable Housing Trust Fund, consisting of the City of Minneapolis and Hennepin County, McKnight Foundation, Vanguard Charitable, Greater Minnesota Housing Fund, LISC of the Twin Cities. And phase two of our project is to renovate the office and programmatic space. We have 4.75 million in pending requests. From the Minneapolis Foundation, Senator Smith's 2024 congressionally directed spending, and Senator Klobuchar's 2024 congressional directed spending. Today I ask you to look at this historic surplus and think of the consequences of historical underfunding of our communities. We have done so much with so little for so long, but it doesn't have to be that way. You can decide to make monumental change in our community that will allow our people to heal for generations to come. You can be a part of the solution by providing support for Senate File 2009. Weeble Hawangale, thank you all, and I'm prepared to answer questions related to my project at this time. Thank you so much, Ms. Cummings. Um, just a reminder to all the project directors that we do need the MMB project forms. I understand we have some of them, but we don't have them all. And that would give us kind of information about the total cost of the project and uh, how, much, how much you've raised already privately, so I don't have to ask that question here today. And also, um, if it can be phased. Uh, if, uh, that's really important for us as well, because we do, as I said, we had 500 bills before the committee, and we have a lot of requests out there, a lot of needs for infrastructure. Right, Senator Housley? <laughs> <laughs> She's nodding. <laughs> Great. Um, thank you very much. Now, who else do we have here joining us? Bonjour. My name is Janice LaFlo, and I'm the founder and the primary guide at the Montessori American Indian Child Care Center. And I'm here to speak as a member of the Oyate Ota Center Collaborative. Thank you for allowing me to testify here today in one of the people's house, all built on native land. The Oyate Ota Center is a transformational vision for the future of the community, wealth building, and health in the greater East Metro, meaning the people's place in the Dakota language. Our vision is to power a coalition of nonprofits, public agencies that are eager to co-locate services in a community and cultural centered space. The center will offer a complete ecosystem of services supporting all of life stages from prenatal to elder. The founding members of the Oyate Ota Center include the Montessori American Indian Child Care Center, the American Indian Family Center, and Interfaith Action of Greater St. Paul Department of Indian Work. Together, our organizations currently serve 2,500 household, 2, households a year, but to, the need is far greater. We project that the Oyate Ota Center will nearly double our capacity to serve our relatives. 
To date, our organizations have invested over 70,000 in advancing this vision, and Representative McCollum is advancing a $2 million congressional appropriation request for fiscal year 2024, and we are also partnering with Ramsey County on a potential site. The Oyate Ota Center will have a dramatic impact on the stability and economic mobility of the American Indian community in the East Metro. The median household income for American Indians in Ramsey County is just $39,667, meaning that almost every American Indian family in the county we sit here today in qualify as low income households, according to HUD. The center will help enter will help people enter the workforce while simultaneously preparing them for the next generation to be leaders of tomorrow. Interconnectedness is an important core value in our community. And so as I think about what we are working towards today, I want to leave you with a couple of thoughts. The first is that our children absolutely deserve this investment. We've been doing this work for many years, as Marissa said, and believe it's time to provide our children and our families with our own people's place, their own Oyate Ota Center. Earlier today, as I spent my day with children, one of my children came running up and said, Miss Janice, Miss Janice, I did it. What'd you do? I flipped and I landed it. So my sentiment today is my job here today is to land it so that our children can have that center in the future. Miigwech and know that we are deeply grateful for your support. Thank you so much, Ms. LaFlo. What a pleasure to work with such great young people. Uh, Senator Dibble, do you have your list of witnesses or should I work off mine? Uh, yeah, I do not have the list, okay. so why don't we off, work off yours? And, and Madam Chair, I just wanted... Uh, oh, I'm sorry. We have a question from Senator Nelson. I forgot. I'm yes. sorry. Th thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Ms. LaFleur, uh, I'm very uh, intrigued with uh, what I've read and what I've heard regarding the Montessori American Indian Child Care Center. And I'm wondering, can you tell me, uh, does the... So we know the Montessori... Uh, program is so uh, successful, mm -hmm. wonderful. Does this preschool follow a Montessori type preschool? We are. We it's are definitely. an AMI recognized. Oh, I'm sorry. It's okay. Um, we are an AMI recognized um, affiliate school, and we've been embedding um, American Indian language and culture for the nine years that we have been open. We are happy to announce that come July, we'll begin our 10th year of serving our indigenous children in the East Metro. Senator Nelson. Thank you, uh, Ms. LaFleur. And so then this is a Montessori uh, pr program. It is. That's yes. phenomenal. Thank you so much. Very impressive. I love Montessori, too. Yes. W wonderful. Wonderful. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, then I have a my list from um, AICDC, Mike Gozi, and also from Ada Young, Sherry Remers. If you want and to both join at the table. Just... And I see Senator Kunish has joined us. Senator Kunish, do you want to take Senator Dibble's place, or do you need to go back to your committee? I have to go back to the committee. I just wanted to stop. Well, and we're happy to have you here, and it's wonderful to have partners that can help you out. Yes, right. And Madam Chair, I just wanted, uh, everyone's probably seen this booklet at their places. We have gotten And it. each of the proposals is written up. We're not necessarily going in order, so you'll have to flip around, right. but lots of good information, lots of photographs, so you can contextualize the presentations. Thank you. I'm told the book is alphabetical order, and then we're going off the order of the bill. Oh, great. Okay. Uh, Mr. Gozi. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and Senators, committee members. Uh, I'm Mike Gozi. I'm the CEO of American Indian Community Development Corporation in Minneapolis. AICDC has been involved in homelessness and <coughs> substance abuse disorder since 1992. And... Um, we know now that our American Indian community has been adversely impacted by the opi opioid crisis that we are currently in. AICDC, along with the tribes, band, and nations of Minnesota, and a number of nonprofits, believe that an opioid based inpatient treatment program or center is desperately needed to address the unmet needs of the folks that suffer from this addiction. AICDC has 
been chosen to take the lead in this opportunity. AICDC intends to purchase and rehab a facility that will house a 30 bed inpatient uh, treatment program. And we will, over the course of the year, we believe we will serve 400 clients. Um, this will be a culturally specific treatment programming using both Western medicine and cultural programming practices to address each client's medical, med mentally, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. We also will have an aftercare component that will provide ongoing support and care for our clients. The, tre the treatment program, this idea is supported by the Minnesota tribes and have agreed to provide funding through a 638 contract for the ongoing support and growth of this program. And so what we're asking for is the initial dollars to build the facility. After that, the tribes through uh, Indian Health Service will be able to continually fund the program, uh, both the ongoing operations and the continued growth that we feel we will need in providing this level of service. And so uh, AICD is happy to be part of ULI, the initiative, um, legacy initiative, and we um, are looking forward to your support in helping us achieve um, some healthier lives for um, some of our most needy folks in the state of Minnesota. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Gozi, do you have a site? We don't because we, for a site? We, um, when we first started, we had a site. Mm -hmm. um, but that site has gone, and so we have looked at several sites. We have some ideas, but we are um, we need to have the resources in order to um, purchase a site mm. and move forward. Senator Nelson. Oh, thank you, Madam <clears throat> Chair. Uh, Mr. Gosey, you answered my question about the so, well. The bonding is for the building. What, the operating costs. You answered that uh, through a 638 contract. But can you tell just a little bit about what a 638 contract is? I don't. It's recognize a, that. It, the, the tribes, the <laughs> tribes, excuse me, the, the tribes have a contract with Indian Health Services, and, and that provides a contracted rate that is actually higher than the state's rate for providing the services. And so we will actually be able to fund ongoing uh, support and growth as we uh, feel the need for this um, facility grows. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Great. Thank you very much, Mr. Gozi. Um, next, we have Ms. Reimers. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the Capital Investment Committee. I humbly thank you for the opportunity to share a few precious moments of your time to speak to, speak to you today. I am Sherry Reimers, the Executive Director of Aindal Young Center in St. Paul. Aindal Young Center, as you know, was founded in 1983 and provides a healing place within our community for our American Indian youth and families. It's a national model for providing culturally responsive services, earning a reputation as a strong advocate and innovator of best practices for serving and sustaining vulnerable youth in their path towards healing and self-determination. We have the only emergency shelter in the East Metro that provides a safe space for children as young as age five through 17 being referred through Ramsey and surrounding counties for our community's most vulnerable children in need of protective super supervision. Our organization not only serves countless American Indian youth, but all youth, regardless of gender, race, and ethnicity. Under this proposal, our buildings are more than 100 years old. The request addresses the most urgent capital needs of our buildings. As I mentioned previous, our shelter requires um, pretty extensive tuck pointing repair for crumbling brickwork, replacing our ADA access and emergency fire escape. We also have some serious water mitigation issues in the basement, and for our youth lodge, we, uh, you know, dilapidated rear deck walkways, roofing, and the list goes on. Um, you know, between 2019 and 2023, we have increased our, our staffing, our full-time staff from roughly 32 to 58 staff. On any given day, we, we just get close to 60. Um, and we plan to, you know, continue the innovation that we provide for the community. Um, through the pandemic, we've provided housing and street outreach services to 1,450 American Indian youth and young adults. 
100% of our res residents have developed academic achievement plans to complete their high school and GED and pursue advanced education. 100% of our young people uh, we work with, um, excuse me, with on and off site working, workforce training and entrepreneurship opportunities. 100% of our residencies, we've created personal self-sufficiency plans to ensure sustainable employment and housing security. Over the last year and a half, we've served 550 families with court advocacy, mental health services, and ICWA legal and court monitoring services. More than 600 children and young adults have learned their language, tradition, and culture, which is critical to their path their path to success and significantly lowering statewide disparities of homelessness. I want to again say that it's an honor to speak before you today and thank you for your wisdom, support, and joining our community and seeing our programs forward. Miigwech and thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Remers. Thank you both. Um, next we have Joe Hobart with the American Indian OIC and Louise Matson with the Division of Indian Work. If you could join Senator Dibble at the table. Welcome, Mr. Hobart. Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is Dr. Joe Hobart. I currently serve as the President and CEO of American Indian OIC. I'm Unkpapa Lakota. The American Indian OIC has been in action since 1979, so we're within our 43rd year of operation. We have five core programs and the services that we provide for our community. We have an accredited uh, high school that is under contract with Minneapolis Public Schools that we refer to as being culturally contextualized or indigenized, utilizing our culture and our practices as the centerpiece of the educational effort. We are the only regional and culturally contextualized adult basic education GED program that is approved by the Minnesota Department of Education for our adult learners, both in terms of acquiring a secondary educational credential as well as pursuing career contextualized skill development. We also have an accredited post-secondary school that focuses on career trainings uh, that expedite the process that comes with a full complement of career services, counseling, and employment placement for those seeking immediate uh, skill development into the modern workforce. We have our oldest program, our Dakota Works, uh, which is our employment services program. This is immediate job placement as well as candidate refinement. We've branched out in the past five years to work with returning citizens with our reentry service programs. And our newest department uh, is our safety net services known as Dakota Stability. This is where we operate our Minnesota Family Investment Program, financial rehabilitation services through our partnership with LISC, uh, as well as SNAP ENT and SNAP Outreach. This is the Supplemental Nutritional Assistance Program. Uh, we operate within a building that was built during the Roosevelt administration. It used to be a white and yellow pages dispensary, which generates puzzle, puzzle looks from our younger staff that don't have any clue of what we're talking about. Uh, the challenges we face are ubiquitous with my colleagues from poor plumbing, internet, intermittent internet services, poor electrical wiring, cramped spaces, uh, as we try to provide an education, career training in a situation that will onboard into the 21st century. We have already spent out of pocket $150,000 on pre-development plans, and we have $3.4 million pending from uh, individual donors, philanthropic, and federal sources. Uh, going forward, the impact of a new building and the new state-of-the-art facilities, along with having what our community deserves in their educational processes to be able to onboard into the 21st century economy, we would have a tripling in the student enrollment capacity for our accredited high school. We would have a doubling for our student enrollment for our adult basic education and GED program. We would have a 30% increase in our client relative capacity for our employment services and re-entry services for our returning citizens. We would have a 50% increase in student enrollment capacity for our post-secondary career training schools, which onboard people directly into the workforce with skill sets that are market viable. And we would have a doubling in the client relative capacity for our safety net programming as well. Uh, this is needed because we are seeing a surge in request and utilization of these services, particularly as we emerge further out of the pandemic. And then finally, we are an employment outfit ourselves for our community. We would see a 50% increase in the workforce that we deploy uh, and those that work for the American Indian OIC. Thank you for this time to, to share this story and with myself and my colleagues, and I will yield at this time. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Hobart. Sarah Nelson. Just a brief, just a brief comment. Uh, congratulations. I know you do a great job. Uh, I followed the Indian uh, American Indian OIC. I've seen the great work that you do, and I hope that uh, you're able to continue and expand uh, and, and empower, empower through great education. Thank you. 
Great, thank you. Now we have uh, Ms. Matson. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Louise Matson. I'm White Earth Band of Ojibwe. I'm the Executive Director of the Division of Indian Work. Our mission is to support and strengthen urban American Indian people through culturally based education, traditional healing approaches, and leadership development. And we do that in many ways. We have out of school time programs for youth. We have maternal health and doula services. We provide counseling. Um, we have parenting groups. We do foster care and life skills development. We have services for our elders. And we also operate a food shelf. And in fact, we're the only culturally specific food shelf for American Indians in the South Metro area. So all of our programs at DIW are free of charge to our community. And the majority of our work is done at our headquarters on 10th Avenue and Lake Street in South Minneapolis. Um, our building is about 30 years old. And in the past several years, we've raised money to do some uh, necessary repairs to our building. We've replaced the roof. We've replaced HVAC units. We've resealed and replaced concrete. We've done mold mitigation. We've replaced our water heater, our out of code sprinkler heads. We've carpeted, we've painted. And even last year, we installed a new elevator. And we were able to do this through a really generous um, donations from foundations, tribal gifts, and individuals. So we still do have work to do on our headquarters to make sure that the necessary repairs are done. And that's part of our request for funds today. But additionally, we're seeking funds on that property that we own adjacent to the Division of Indian Work. So this was a house that was purchased in the 1990s. It was renovated into four apartments and we used it as transi transitional housing for decades. But the fact is, the house was built in 1909. It is really no longer feasible to try to renovate it any further or to operate it, and it really needs to be torn down. Mm -hmm. And we would like to build a multi-purpose community center um, in that land. Um, and why, why do we need to do that? Well, last year we served over 6,000 people at Division of Indian Work. That is double the number we served the year before. Um, we continue to see an increase in demand for our services, um, but the reality is we are out of space at Division of Indian Work. We're bursting at the seams. We do not have any space to expand our services. So if we had new space, um, we could double the number of youth programs that we offer. We could implement more groups, such as those for community, uh, or excuse me, for young parents and elders. We could increase the space um, to, that could be utilized by community. And then we could also consider moving some programming to that new space in order to expand our food shelf. Um, DIW employs 45 people, so expanding our programming would also expand our workforce. So finishing the work at the DIW headquarters and funding this new space for our programs ensures that our essential programming by and for the community can continue for decades to come. So miigwech for listening, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Ms. Matson. Appreciate you both coming here today. Um, next, we have uh, Neely Snyder and Sharon Day. <laughs> Welcome, Ms. Snyder. Dream of Wild Health. Um, good afternoon. I'm Neely Snyder. I'm St. Croix Ojibwe and also a direct descendant of Red Lake and Mille Lacs Band of Ojibwe. I'm also the executive director at Dream of Wild Health. We are a native nonprofit with an office located in South Minneapolis and we have a farm located in Hugo. Um, so our mission is to um, restore health and well-being in the native community by recovering knowledge of and access to healthy indigenous foods, medicines, and life ways. We have um, we, this year we are celebrating our 25th anniversary, so we've been serving the community for that long in the urban Twin Cities. Um, we, we meet our mission by creating culturally based opportunities for youth employment, entrepreneurship, and leadership, increasing access to indigenous foods through farm production. Um, we're working with our community. We also have one of the largest um, urban native farms distributing over 12,000 pounds of produce last year directly to the native community. We've recently tripled our farm size from 10 to 30 acres, allowing us more than, to more than triple our distribution efforts in the next three to five years. Our budget at this point is still uh, fluid, so it mm -hmm. keeps increasing. <laughs> um, 
So right now we're at about seven million, and we're seeking uh, five million dollars to support the building um, at our new site. We currently work with over 12,000 community members annually, including 2,000 urban Native youth through our Native Youth Education and Leadership programs, and are projected to more than double that reach with the production of our farm site and building, and potentially tripling in five years. We've already tripled our staff size um, since 2019, including uh, revenue and budget, um, and are expected to continue on that traje trajectory over the next five years with the development of this site and our building that'll house a commu commercial teaching kitchen, processing space, and gathering and learning space for our community members. Additionally, our kitchen will develop future native chefs to be employed in the community, and our native incubator program will provide plots of land to grow fresh produce. Um, Dream of Wild Health will provide resources and technical support, connections to social enterprise opportunities within the community, and will help to develop new native farmers as food producers and distributors in our community. Um, Chi Miigwech for allowing us this time today. Thank you, Ms. Snyder. What's the total cost of your project? Right now we're at seven million. You've raised seven million. We have not raised seven million. Oh. Sorry, we're the, at one point three million. Oh, the total cost is seven million. The total cost okay. would be seven million, but we're still working with contractors, and so mm -hmm. that's a moving target right now. Right, I got it. Unfortunately. <laughs> right. All right. Thank you very thank much. You. And Ms. Day, welcome. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Sharon Day, and I'm the executive director and one of the founders of the Indigenous Peoples Task Force. Uh, we, we, the Indigenous Peoples Task Force has had the honor and privilege of providing services to the Indigenous community for over 33 years. This request is to help us complete a new building, Mikawendan Adesukan, which we desperately need. This new center will house the Indigenous Peoples Task Force programming and the Ikitawan Theater Ensemble. IPTF provides a spectrum of services, including HIV, and I, I would say, tell you that um, we are one of the only indigenous um, programs in the country that are directly funded by the Centers for Disease Control. I believe there's one other program in Phoenix, um, and that brings, um, over a period of five years, $2.5 million uh, into the community. Uh, we also provide harm reduction, um, housing, navigation services, youth peer education programs, our new Indigi baby food, which is based on an indigenous diet, um, and uh, of foods like squash, wild rice, sweet potatoes, um, and, um, and we also have some environmental programming. All of our programs are grounded in our cultural teachings. McWaydan Adu Sukan will be adjacent to our current housing complex, Manadu Wadak Odena, on the block between 24th and 23rd and 13th and 14th uh, avenues in South Minneapolis. Uh, the, the building construction will include green elements uh, in the construction, such as compressed earth block. And we will have um, quite a bit of space in the front of the building where we will do some regenerative uh, landscaping and some gardens. Um, IPTF was deemed, uh, we were deemed essential workers and worked and grew our programs through the COVID um, pandemic. Um, all of our youth programs continued um, utilizing Zoom. We produced a new play that was filmed uh, during that time. And um, also our HIV programs grew, thus the need for more clinical space. This additional space will allow us to hire immediately four new employees and the theater space will allow us to double our youth programming from 100 to 200 youth per year. Um, I'd just like to say one word about the theater program. Since May of 1990, we have produced over a dozen original plays which highlight the social justice and health issues in our community. Our youth have gone on to become leaders in the community and the healthcare field, the arts, banking, and community services. Uh, we have a new peer-to-peer -peer coaching and navigation program and we placed about six youth um, from those internships into other into full-time employment. Uh, we have attained six million dollars in funds from individual donors, foundations, and tribal contributions, city and county sources. We need four million to complete the construction budget. Our original goal was five million, which we have raised. However, the additional cost of adding three more clinical offices for counseling and testing case and case management 
Um, but, mo mo but most of that is in the increased cost of construction. I want to say, um, miigwech, thank you so much for your uh, attention and your consideration. Thank you, Ms. Day. Um, so you already have, uh, are you building a new building or are you expanding a current building? We are building a new building. Okay, um, and what's the total cost? The total cost is uh, 11 million. 11 million. It, it seems and, to change. And, and you have a site? Day. We have a site, so the new building will be, so we have a, a, a housing complex, which we built in 1997 in South Minneapolis. Uh, in fact, we share a park, parking lot with MIWRC. So our housing complex is there, 14 units, and currently we're being housed in, in what was a community center for the housing complex. Mm -hmm. um, the city of Minneapolis is going to sell us the, it's basically the other half of the block, for um, for a dollar, they value that property at about two hundred eighty million, eighty thousand. Great. Okay. I'm excited that a lot of your students are doing theater. Thank great. you. It's a great training for politics. Indeed. <laughs> Me and Ronald Reagan. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, uh, both of you. And now we have Mr. Joe Boulot from Little Earth Neighborhood Early Learning Center. Oh, he's doing three and, and a couple other projects. <clears throat> Welcome, Mr. Bolo. Good afternoon. My name is Joe Bolio. Um, I, am, yep, I am Red Lake Ojibwe, and I am the executive director of Little Earth Residence Association. And today I'll be filling you in on our three projects we have going on at Little Earth for our housing complex, um, Little Earth Residence Association, and the Neighborhood Early Learning Center. So Little Earth United Tribes was founded 50 years ago and is a 212-unit HUD-subsidized housing community in South Minneapolis, and it's the only Native American preference housing community of its kind in the urban United States. We have upwards of 1,200 residents, about half of which are under the age of 21. Our residents are 99% Native American, representing over 38 tribal nations. The average income of our um, households is $10,000, and we have a majority female, single-family head of households. We provide supportive housing with on-site social services through Little Earth Resident Association and the Little Earth Neighborhood Early Learning Center, which includes a variety of culturally relevant programs and direct services for youth, adults, families, and elders that uplift and empower residents through advocacy, resource sharing, education support, and life skills. A major goal of ours is eviction prevention, and we want to provide our families with the tools to be successful renters and future homeowners. Our facilities have not had any major updates in the last 50 years. Little Earth Housing is requesting $5 million um, from the state. This funding will help make much needed livability improvements to our facilities, including ADA and safety upgrades, and will improve service access and ultimately allow us to serve more residents as our community and programs we offer continue to grow. The City of Minneapolis has promised $1.5 million for property improvements, and we have also applied for appropriations from Senator Smith's office and Representative Omar's office. And we're also exploring other options to cover the huge cost of this project. The Little Earth Neighborhood Early Learning Center is requesting $1.25 million to make much needed improvements to the building and the playground facility, both for strong safety concerns and to meet licensure requirements for the child care center in the building. Um, if we were to lose this child care center, it would be a major detriment to our neighborhood and our community. There is currently no funding secured for this project, but we continue to seek and apply for grants. The Little Earth Residents Association is requesting $3.5 million to build the Little Earth Innovation Hub, which is a greenhouse and aquaponics facility that will include a classroom space and a commercial kitchen. This facility will be able to provide food year-round for our residents and neighbors, as well as ultimately sustain itself with the sale of excess produce and fish. This building will also expand our current urban farm program, which is a paid internship that provides workforce development and life skills. Currently, over 60 youth are signed up to work and learn in the farm this summer. This building will allow us to have this program year-round and employ program graduates to help us operate the facilities and maintain the program into the future. Lear is also requesting an additional $300,000 to begin the pre-design to renovate our current community center. The current space has many limitations and our community needs more space for public gatherings and for our youth programs, and also a weatherized space that's prepared for emergency situations. The Innovation Hub currently has $800,000 secured from the Shield One Foundation in partnership with the NFL and the Minnesota Vikings, as well as a pro bono development team and attorneys. Uh, we have also applied for appropriations from Representative Omar's office. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, Senator Nelson. Thank you very much. You mentioned uh, the 
other mini outreaches with uh, different uh, some of the some federal money and such. And I'm just curious, um, or maybe at a later time if you don't have it right now, it'd be good to know what you've requested from all of those different sources, uh, just as we get try and get a fuller picture of yeah. what the exact need is that might not be filled somewhere else, or maybe it could be. But but you don't, I understand you don't know yet. But it'd just be helpful to kind of get a list of those other grant requests. Yeah, for well, this specific. Project. Specific, uh, Sen Mr. Bullio. Specifically for the housing project, I know that the renovation is going to cost over $30 million. So I think that we have asked for roughly $15 million from the Senator's office. And then I think about $3 million from President Omar's office. And then for the Innovation Hub, we requested about $3 million for the project. Mm -hmm. um, we want to start building the innovation hub this year, but we hope to with if we were to get that money that next year we could really complete the project and help it achieve its full potential. And um, Senator Nelson, Mr. Bulio, I think we have one of the MMB forms for you, but on the Little Earth United Tribes Housing Association, but we need them on the other two projects. And okay. Senator Nelson, that that has those questions on those forms. Right. Great. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you for you. being here today. Um, Ms. Lawrence from Wakan Tipi, and then we have Robert Lilligren from Native American Community Development Institute. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, welcome. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Um, my name is Maggie Lorenz, and I'm the executive director for Lower Failing Creek Project. We are a native-led environmental conservation nonprofit based here in St. Paul, and our mission is to engage people to honor and care for our natural places and the sacred sites and cultural value within them. Through our educational programs and traditional ecological knowledge and cultural connections and healing, we um, engage uh, and serve more than 6,000 Minnesotans every year. In addition, we engage more than 450 volunteers annually to provide stewardship to parks and green spaces in the city of St. Paul, and in particular, landscapes that have cultural value and significance. Our major accomplishment to date is the restoration and establishment of the 27-acre Bruce Vento Nature Sanctuary. This public green space serves as a border between St. Paul's east side and lower town communities, and this site is also one of great cultural significance to the Dakota Oyate. Within this unassuming nature preserve lies a cherished sacred cave known as Wakantipi. Over the last 15 years, our organization has been working towards the development of a cultural and environmental interpretive center, Wakantipi Center, that will educate visitors on the history, ecology, and cultural value of this special place of power. We began site work for Walcon Teepee Center last fall using private funds, and the project has significant momentum at this moment as site grading and utilities were substantially completed in November of 2022. So this project is split into three phases. Phase one was site preparation work, and that was completed um, last year. Phase two is the building construction. And then we have phase three, the permanent parking lot expansion, which can only be started after the Kellogg Third Street Bridge project is complete in St. Paul. So um, with phase one uh, complete, we did exceed our estimated budget by a million dollars due to um, escalations in site utilities, concrete, uh, contractor labor costs. And in addition, we exceeded our budgeted contingency in phase one due to unexpected soil conditions. Um, and so due to these additional costs in phase one, we have uh, more money now that we have to raise for phase two and three. So as of today, our total project cost is 13.4 million. We have raised 10.5 million to date and have a remaining gap of 2.9. We are requesting 2.5 million from the state in this legislative session and have a strong confidence in our ability to raise the remaining $400,000 from other sources pending. Um, and I do want to note that due to inflation um, and additional site work costs, we have reduced the size of our building from its original 9,000 square feet to 7,500 square feet. Mm -hmm. So we have completed the redesign work for this and are now ready to start the bidding process. However, as you know, we can't go out to bidding until commitments are secured. Uh, so with this bonding, we will complete this project. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Ms. Lawrence. I'm looking forward to the project. I was at the groundbreaking. It was exciting. Yes. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Uh, welcome, Mr. Lilligren. Yeah, bonjour and bienvenue. Hello, my relatives. I'm Robert Lilligren. I'm a citizen of the White Earth Ojibwe Nation, a third generation Minneapolis urban Indian, uh, and I'm C president and CEO of the Native American Community Development Institute, or NACD. Uh -huh. Madam Chair, committee members, thanks for this opportunity to address you. Uh, I want to thank my good friend, Senator Dibble, for stepping in as our champion, and thank you all for your service to the state of Minnesota. NACD, Native American Community Development Institute, is an asset-based community <coughs> development agent active in the local, regional, and statewide community. We're systems change people, and we work in the policy realm and boardroom realm and stay authentically connected to the community through our programming, primarily in the areas of Native arts and culture, food sovereignty, and community uh, engagement and empowerment. Uh, NACTI is sort of the people side of community engagement over the sort of the bricks and mortar side. Uh, NACTI promotes the community vision of an American Indian cultural corridor along East Franklin Avenue in South Minneapolis. That's a, the American Indian cultural corridor is a community-led economic development strategy to create a native-led destination and economic engine along East Franklin Avenue. Our little yellow building, some of you may have been there, on East Franklin Avenue houses uh, our gallery, All My Relations Arts, which is one of the premier contemporary Native arts gallery in the region. We also have a Native-owned coffee shop as a tenant, Powwow Grounds, which is a hub of community, um, community activity. And until recently, we it's been the headquarters of two Native Orgs, ours, NACTI, and also my COSIES, American Indian CDC, with whom we co-own the building. American Indian CDC has moved out into different offices, which gives us an opportunity to expand our footprint within, within the building we co-own. Our building is a recognized hub in the community, and we adapt it to best serve the people and the community and what we hear from them. And I think a great example of that was during the civil unrest uh, in the summer of 2020. We emptied out our gallery and turned that into a pop-up uh, uh, food shelf that was serving not just the Native community, but our non-Native uh, members as well. Our programming is primarily it's funded primarily through philanthropic sources, secondarily through contracts with public sector, uh, with the public sector and public sector grants. We earn some of our own income through consulting services and then individual giving. To date, we've spent about $25,000 on our $971,500 phase one of our project, and the sources of that uh, are uh, $200 in funds from the Mellon Foundation to implement a long plan, uh, new business model and train strategy, uh, change strategy, we call it. Uh, and we still have most of those funds on hand for pre-development costs, but those are not eligible for capital. So that's why we're asking for the capital uh, from the state. Uh, NACTI will be able to deepen and broaden our community engagement and amplify our collective impact. Uh, the benefits uh, to this project will expand beyond its current occupants to benefit the broader Native community, the non-Native communities, increase the visibility and efficiency of our work, and give Native people a stronger sense of pride and ownership on the American Indian Cultural Corridor. NACTI will be able to expand our professional development programs in the areas of Native artists, Native authors, Native entrepreneurs, farmers, market vendors, uh, as well as provide expanded, expanded space to Powell Grounds Coffee Shop, a new retail space for a variety of Native vendors. I want to thank you for listening to me today and to say how proud I am to stand with this incredible group of Native, excuse me, leaders. Miigwech. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Lilligren, and then I would appreciate your MMB form so that I have all the information I need about your project. Thank you, Madam Chair. It has been submitted. It must just be making its way to you now. Okay, making its way. Yeah. All right. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you both very much. Um, now we have Ms. Ms. Yazzie with the New American Theater. New Native Theater, sorry. And then is this, this is a new bill, right? So that's the end. All right. Great. Welcome. Hi. Um, gosh, I'm more nervous than when we produce a play. <laughs> uh, good afternoon, Madam Just Chair. Just pretend you're playing a role. Okay. It's not really you. It's the role of my life. Yes. <laughs> 
Well, good afternoon, uh, Madam Chair and Senators. Uh, my name is Rihanna Yazi. I'm a citizen of the Navajo Nation, and I'm the founder and artistic director of a 15-year-old theater company called New Native Theater. We're the only Native American nonprofit in this group that specializes solely on creating plays for the American theater stage. And over the past 15 years, we've produced over 100 plays and events. In the Twin Cities and nationally, we are the only Native American theater company with its own 501c status, a full-time staff who all make living wages, something even rare among our arts peers in the performing arts. And we have the biggest budget of any Native American theater company in the United States. We're confident we'll be ending this fiscal year with a budget of nearly $600,000. Our plays and events are all about the Native American experience. We excel at creating meaningful careers in the performing arts for Native Americans. In just the few years that we've been around, some of our alumni are now some of the most visible Native artists in film and television today. We've trained and worked with Minnesota Native Minnesotan actors and writers who are now on shows on FX, Hulu, HBO, and I myself am a writer for AMC's 2022 highest rated TV series, Dark Winds. New Native Theater gives culturally relevant support and training that non-native spaces cannot and have not. The Twin Cities has 100 theater companies. And um, we know that the power of performing arts raises self-esteem and promotes health and well-being, uh, especially among native artists, audiences, and communities. It allows native people to see themselves portrayed in relevantly, positively and realistically, in realistic ways on stage, and it brings understanding about Native people to the broader uh, community and Minnesota who just don't know much about us. So it's time for us to have our own performance venue to do this work. Um, we actually have an office. It's the old mail room inside the Division of Indian Work, and we have produced plays in nearly every one of the Yuli uh, spaces, and I can attest that they need to be redone. <laughs> <laughs> um, we've partnered with the Minneapolis American Indian Center to build a to plan to build a 200 seat theater in their phase two of their current redesign. Um, and when we get this space, we'll be able to um, continue production of nationally recognized plays and our, expand our education and training programs. And we will make earned income through ticket sales, concessions, rentals, and educational programming. We will create jobs. We have front of house staff, box office, technical and design staff, actors, writers, educators, consultants on native art and culture. And we will continue to work with artists of all disciplines throughout uh, through our artist development programs. Right now, we employ about 70 staff and contractors on average every year, and with the venue, this will just quadruple. This building can be a national beacon for Minnesota. No other place in the U.S. has a native performing arts venue like this, focusing on telling accurate and excellent plays about the Native American experience. We would be a singular national destination. I came to Minnesota 16 years ago because of the American Indian community's positive reputation nationally and because how unique Minnesotans are in appreciating and supporting the performing arts. And I've made it my life's work to appreciate the investments that we've made that, that, are, that have been made in me. And today I ask um, that we'll be able to get your support for $300,000 to begin our pre-design process of creating a venue unlike any other in the country. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Ms. Yassi. Thank Looking you. Looking forward to seeing your plays. Thank you, and right. you, we gave you each one of these. Oh, wonderful, <laughs> that's great. Thank you that's so much. Good, promote it whenever you can. <laughs> right. um, thank you so much, all of you who came here today with these um, wonderful projects. Uh, Senator Nelson. <laughs> kind of an overall comment. I really appreciate uh, the uh, entities that came forward and talked about upgrades to existing buildings or renovations. Uh, those things make so much sense. And not that the other projects do not, but I would note that there's nine, uh, well, and some things like a farm or a theater, those are very particular. But there's about seven or eight new buildings 
here, and I know this is the bonding committee, Madam Chair, but I, I think you were talking about uh, an all-cash bill, which means it doesn't have to be a new building. And I, I just think I'd be remiss if I didn't at least put that out there for some consideration that uh, there's a real glut of um, buildings, empty buildings, uh, not just in the metro area, but many places just because of uh, perhaps the results of uh, more working from home or something like that. But I just have to note that I like to see, uh, particularly when there's um, existing buildings that are being reused, and I think that's a, a opportunity when it's an all-cash bonding bill mm -hmm. that might not present itself in other times. So I, I just wanted to add that to the conversation. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much, Senator Nelson. I appreciate those comments. We certainly want to preserve what we have. Um, Senator Dibble, another Senator Kunish bill, um, Senate Bill 2830. Um, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I also just wanted to reflect on the presentation we made and I'll just echo what uh, Robert Lilligren uh, stated. It was a great honor to sit alongside um, such uh, incredible leaders, uh, many of whom I regard as mentors and heroes of mine. So this has been an extreme honor in my life. I, I think, do we want to take a pause? Well, do people need to leave? <laughs> Maybe we'll just take a short pause so you can do that. The committee is in recess for one minute. my competent vice chair, but I didn't want to miss the presentation. <laughs> so um, Senate file 2830 and uh, Senator Dibble and Mr. Maher. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Again, an honor to uh, represent a, a Senate file on behalf of Senator Kunish. Um, and this has to do with a project in Friendly Fridley. Fridley has undertaken a master planning process to re reimagine their park system 
including 38 city parks. Senate file 2830 requests funding for an inclusive playground at Fridley's Commons Park. All children deserve access to a safe place to play. Playgrounds should not only accommodate physical disabilities, but also include the unique needs of children with intellectual or developmental disabilities who need fencing, separation from water hazards, and physical barriers on busy streets to keep them safe. This bill provides funding to the city of Fridley who is working in partnership with community stakeholders for pre-planning, design, and construction of a play space that will be truly accessible and inclusive to all children, including those with all types of disabilities. This 23-acre park is centrally located in the heart of Fridley within close walking distance to Fridley Public Schools Preschool, Hayes Elementary, Middle School, and High School serving 2,500 students. The school district's minority enrollment is 60% and 43% of students are economically disadvantaged. This project would support the developmental needs of many thousands of individuals in Fridley and neighboring communities, including physical, cognitive, sensory, and social development. The city of Fridley is matching the bonding request uh, with 500, $500,000. And with that, uh, we have the, uh, the parks director. Correct. Um, uh, our parks director in Fridley. Um, welcome, Mr. Maher. Just introduce yourself for the record. Yeah, Mike Mayer, Parks and Recreation Director for the City of Fridley. Um, I, I did want to just mention, um, I thought everyone would get the hint when other people's phones were going off that they should silence their phones. So please, everyone, silence your phones. Thank you. Mr. Maher, please continue. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. <clears throat> About a year and a half ago, um, the city of Fridley was approached by a collection of groups that are advocating for an increase in the number of inclusive play spaces in the Twin Cities metro area and, in fact, across the state of Minnesota. Uh, these organizations include Gillette Children's Hospital, Alina Health, the Multicultural Autism Action Network, the ARC of Minnesota, the Autism Society of Minnesota, the Coalition uh, for Children with Disabilities, and the Minnesota Cons Consortium for C Citizens with Disabilities. And when we were contacted by this group, uh, the timing was absolutely perfect, and we had um, a really wonderful park project uh, in mind that aligned extremely well with the uh, goals that this organization, okay. the, these organizations laid forward. Um, since 2019, the city of Fridley um, has been involved in a very robust uh, re uh, resident engagement effort to reimagine our park system. Uh, we worked with a consultant, WSB, to identify approximately $50 million in improvements across all of our 38 parks. Uh, at the heart of our park system is Commons Park, and we currently have a master plan for this park that includes about $12 million in improvements, uh, which would include a splash pad, improved athletic facilities, picnic shelters, a park building, and of course, an inclusive playground. Um, as the Senator mentioned in his introduction, uh, this park really is uh, centrally located in Fridley. Um, it's uh, walkable from three different schools and the <coughs> Fridley Community Center, and it is well connected to Fridley's uh, network of act active transportation trails. Um, <clears throat> the vision of this park project is to provide a play space that is accessible, safe, and enjoyable for all visitors, including individuals with physical disabilities, and it also uh, those with intellectual or developmental disabilities. Uh, this playground project is, again, budgeted at $1 million, and uh, our request is for $500,000 in funding, uh, which would be matched by the city of Fridley. Um, I'm still hearing a phone ringing. Is it my imagination? <laughs> please, whoever has that ringing phone, would you please silence it or take it out of the room? Thank you. Uh, Mr. Maher, did you have anything more to add? Chair Pappas? Just a... It's really getting kind of annoying. Chair Pappas? Yes. I wonder if I need to interpret that in Hmong. Would oh, you mind? okay. Please. Uh, Thorne 
Thank you. Okay. Hopefully that will help. Thank you very much, Senator Pa. Um, thank you, Mr. Maher. Appreciate it. Right. I love thank these accessible playground ideas. I think it's really a time I, we should be doing this. Right. Thank you, Madam thank Chair you. and members of the committee. Uh, Senator Mayquade with another accessible playground. Welcome, Senator McQuaid. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. The City of Apple Valley recognizes that creating equitable and inclusive recreation spaces for all individuals of all abilities, backgrounds, and identities can enhance the outcomes in neighborhood development, health disparities, and educational backgrounds across the community and region. By updating our programming and facilities, barriers to access for people with disabilities and veterans will be reduced and even eliminated, helping them gain a feeling of inclusion and social equity. With over 257,000 residents between Apple Valley, Burnsville, Egan, and Lakeville, residents of these communities as well as the surrounding area will benefit from the construction of an inclusive playground and supporting park amenities. Um, I have our parks director with me uh, that can just do a very brief overview of the playground, and I will just say at the outset, the total project cost is $9.6 million. We are asking the state to cover $1.3 million. Um, thank you, and welcome Mr. Carlson. Thank you, Chair. Members of the committee, Eric Carlson, Parks and Recreation Director for the City of Apple Valley. Um, the City of Apple Valley is looking to improve uh, Redwood Park. It's one of the oldest parks we have in the system, built in the late 60s. So a lot of the infrastructure we have in the park needs to be replaced. We are looking at um, building the inclusive playground will be the centerpiece of the park, but also making sure that we have an inclusive picnic shelter, parking, splash pad, and trails found within the park. The inclusive playground, much like the last presentation, is an excellent amenity for those in the, in the community that may, be, uh, that may find themselves with a disability, and it's really good for people of all abilities to learn how to play together um, in that environment. Um, it provides a safe haven for people with disabilities, and sometimes it, it gives families the first time to actually and truly play together um, on a playground. Um, it makes available auditory and sensory activities and a different level of challenges for all types of people. Our request is for $1.3 million of a total project of 9.6, which represents about 14% of the project, with the city covering about 50% of the project. The funds, um, if, if uh, granted, would be used for design, project man management, and construction. And those are my comments. Do we pay? A certain amount. Project, a certain amount. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. Thank you very much, Mr. Carlson. Appreciate it. I just had a side question here. Yep. But yeah. Thank you, Senator McQuaid. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right. Thank you. We have letters of support, I see, in our packets. Um, next, we um, have a presentation by the Minnesota State Academies, and we. Senator Dibble first. Oh, Senator Dibble first. Senator Dibble, 914. I'm sorry, I jumped ahead. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Continuing on uh, the general theme of access and accessibility, mm -hmm. um, uh, it's, I'm pleased to present Senate file number 914. I'd also like to take the opportunity to thank my co-author, Senator Mohammed. Um, and just very uh, quickly, uh, Madam Chair and members, um, the City of Minneapolis uh, Public Works Department has been constructing pedestrian curb ramps for a very long time, since 1970. Um, and of course those curb ramps were consistent with the design criteria of that time, but that design criteria has since changed. Um, and so um, they've been since that time been going over. Uh, a lot of the curb ramps uh, that have, have, had already been made accessible according to the criteria at that time, um, and, and updating all of them as well as those that simply never got that sort of treatment. So overall, Minneapolis has jurisdiction over 17,800 curb ramps, or basically corners, uh, with, throughout, the, throughout the city. Um, and approximately 6,200 of those are uh, in good condition, equivalent to about 35% of those in, in Minneapolis. I'm looking for the cost, or the estimated uh, cost to upgrade all the city's curb ramps uh, is about $430 million. Uh, which will uh, take anywhere from 20 to 30 years uh, to complete. Um, and this is uh, not inexpensive work. 
Uh, on average, it costs about $10,000 per corner for a pedestrian curb Sorry, ramp upgrades. Um, uh, if we're doing all of the various accessibility improvements at intersections, it can cost anywhere from 117,000 to 233,000 for an entire intersection. Um, so that just gives you a, an idea of the scope and scale of the effort that Minneapolis is undertaking to make it a more accessible community for all the people who come to Minneapolis, not just those who live there, but those who come to work and play um, and interact uh, with our built infrastructure in Minneapolis. Then with that, uh, Madam Chair, we have Kathleen Mayle from the City of Minneapolis Public Works Department who can share some more information. Okay, I had Jennifer Hager. So it's Kathy Nail. Uh, Madam Chair, I am Jennifer Hager. Oh, you are Jennifer could Hager. not be here today. So. Okay. <laughs> um, Senator Dibble, before we go to Ms. Hager, um, how much did you say it would cost to um, put in all the curb cuts that need to go in? Uh, $430 million. $430 million. Yeah. Wow. All right. Thank you. Welcome, Ms. Hager. Thank you, Madam Chair, committee members. My name is Jennifer Hager. I'm the Director of Transportation Planning and Programming for the City of Minneapolis Department of Public Works. I'm pleased to testify today in support of Senate File 914, which would provide $10 million in general obligation uh, bonds to the City of Minneapolis to help with pedestrian curb ramp upgrades. As the Senator mentioned, the City's been constructing pedestrian curb ramps since 1970, and when first constructed, these ramps did meet the design criteria at that time. However, changing design standards means that while a pedestrian curb ramp might exist, they may not be compliant with current design standards per the Americans with Disabilities Act and as required by the federal government. Minneapolis has over 17,800 pedestrian curb ramps in our jurisdiction. The city has upgraded approximately 35% of those ramps and we're working to upgrade the rest. We estimate that at our current rate, it will take anywhere from 20 to 30 years to complete these remaining upgrades. The $10 million under consideration would ensure that the city can accelerate this important work to ensure that all residents have access to sidewalks citywide. This effort aligns with recent plans and policy that center safety, equity, and mobility as citywide transportation goals. Policies that support this work include our Transportation Action Plan, our ADA Transition Plan, and our Complete Streets Policy. I'd like to share a quote from a survey response that we received during our engagement efforts on our ADA transition plan development. Begin quote, being confined to a wheelchair in Minneapolis is very challenging. It destroys my confidence every day. I feel very confined unless my aid is with me to help with obstacles, end quote. Ensuring accessibility to our nearly 2,000 miles of city-owned <coughs> sidewalks is critically important work. We currently upgrade about 460 pedestrian curb ramps a year through various capital programs. These additional funds would allow us to meaningfully accelerate our efforts. Thank you, Senator Dibble, for carrying this bill, and thank you again for the opportunity to testify in support of it. I'm happy to stand for any questions. Uh, Ms. Hager, when you reconstruct a street, does that also include redoing the curb cuts? Uh, Madam Chair, committee members, yes, it yeah, does. It would. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair, members. Um, now we do have the Minnesota State Academies, and we want to hear from them while we still have the ASL interpreters. Thank you very much, Ms. Chino and Ms. Peters. You have a microphone. Good. Can you hear me okay? Mr. Wilding. Yes, Mr. Wilding. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for making time for me today. My name is Terry Wilding. I am the superintendent of the Minnesota State Academies. I oversee two schools in the city of Faribault. At this time, many of you are maybe new. So let me do a little bit of an overview of what our programs are, and then I'll explain what our requests are. We have two schools, one for the blind students and one for the deaf students. We serve students throughout the state of Minnesota. We are a statewide school that serves school districts from all over the Minnesota borders. 
They may also be deaf and blind and attend both schools. Some of our students do do that. We have 60 different districts currently that we serve. At the deaf school, we can start services at 18 months old to age 21. Those services vary from educational language development, curriculum following age appropriate benchmarks, as well as transitioning as students become 18 to 21. We follow the federal laws related to the IDEA, and we can serve students up to age 21. We have ASL and English. We use a bilingual approach in our education. At the blind school, we start at kindergarten to age 21. The same idea is for accessibility and vision impaired services. Specialty services such as Braille, orientation and mobility, music therapy, expanded core curriculum. These are different categories that are included as well as our A plus program for our 18 to 21 year old students. Overall, our students focus on making each student fully accessible. <coughs> Not feeling that they are excluded or unique, that they have equivalent access for all activities in and outside the classroom. Whether they'll be social emotional skills, communication skills, language development, all of those activities give them equivalency. There should be no barriers in their school environment and that's our goal. About 40% of our students live in dorms. Minnesota is a pretty big state. We can't drive home every day. So some of our students do live in dorms. We have a variety of dorm programming, such as activities and after school, uh, whether that would be sports, extracurricular organizations and clubs, independent living skills. We also do some teaching and tutoring into the evening. We are fully funded by the <coughs> legislator. We are appropriated by you. There is no other income source that we can attain through levy or fundraising. We are a school district, but because we are a state agency, we have to follow the state funding sources. We depend on your support for different projects and program needs. This year, we have three requests that are included that went to the governor's office. The first one is dorm renovation project. We have different dorms on both campuses, and most of our buildings were built before the 1960s, some of them even in the 1930s. They do not meet today's ADA accessibility standards, and more and more of our students have additional physical disabilities, which requires more wheelchair accessibility, uh, lifts, as our old dorms do not have the appropriate design to match their needs. We would like to do renovations of the three wings at the blind school campus and one dorm at the deaf school campus. That would bring them up to code, to ADA code, have them accessible, as well as one of the dorms also needs an HVAC replacement. Uh, they have air conditioning window units right now, which really is not the best for our students. With those renovations, it's 7.8 million that is requested. Our second request, we have some very old buildings on the deaf school campus. We are asking for a pre-design of 240000 to evaluate and develop a plan on how to either renovate or replace five buildings that are on the deaf school campus. Many of those buildings are high maintenance needs and absorb a lot of our energy, our time to keep them maintained. And they do not meet our needs at this point. So assessing how we can best use our athletic PE facilities, our cafeteria facilities, our career tech facilities. All of that would be the possibility of replacing five buildings from 127 to 90 years old to one building. Our third request is to maintain our facilities, to keep our campuses running, safety, accessibility, meeting the code requirements. We have children from 18 months to 21, so our needs vary greatly. Our buildings, making them accessible, user-friendly. For example, some of our buildings need to replace the external stone, our heating equipment, 
are roof replacements, road, walkways, parking. There's many projects that are requested in the 2.6 asset preservation fund. That is an overview of what we are trying to do on our campuses. Our goal is to provide the best and most accessible environment for our students. That is also the safest. We have highly vulnerable students that we take care of, and we hope for your support in helping us maintain a good campus in Faribault. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Wilding. What is the total enrollment at your campuses? Right now, we have uh, smaller enrollment numbers due to COVID. Some of our students have shifted back to other programs. Right now, I believe we have uh, 74 students at the deaf school and 50 students at the blind school. The blind school's numbers have been stable. The deaf school, uh, normally we're closer to 100. We're a little bit smaller right now, but we are getting more students even as we speak. We have two new students that arrived last week and more that are coming and scheduled to tour in the next few weeks. Um, do you have a, like a total capacity that you can't go over? And do you, do you usually, pre-COVID, did you have a waiting list? We have never had a waiting list. Uh, we try to include all of our students as much as we can. We do not have a capacity cap at this time. If we go towards the number of beds that we have in the dorm, we have 125 at the deaf school campus. And I believe there's 77 beds or 78 beds at the blind school campus. Now, not all of our students sleep on campus. Uh -huh. So we exceed that number. If we go by the number of residential beds, that limits us. But day students, we really have no limit at this time. OK. Great. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? All right, thank you, Mr. Wilding, and once again, thank you to the interpreters. Uh, Senator Pa, Senate File 3038. Welcome, Senator Pa. <laughs> it seems our seniors here are more popular than our senators here when it comes to phone calls. Um, they I are getting their phones. I testify are. up here with me. <laughs> I've given up. <laughs> <laughs> I just can't be mean. <laughs> um, Madam Chair and members, thank you for the opportunity to present Senate File 3038. And thank you to Senator uh, Tu Hyung for uh, being my co-author on this bill. This bill seeks to provide funding to acquire property, pre-design, design, construct, furnish, and equipped in Hmong, Minnesota Community Center in the city of St. Paul. Behind me, all the people here. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we have community leaders, members, and our elders uh, here asking for your support of this bill. Over 90,000 Hmong people call Minnesota home, lived here for almost 50 years, yet we have never been able to realize a Hmong community center, despite the numerous pleas for investment in the Hmong community to close the education, the equity gap, support families, uh, to have stability, to receive assistance that they need to thrive. This community center will serve the Hmong families and the community. It will be a community space and hub for culturally specific resources and social services. It will also have space for community gatherings, activities, rooms for workshops, and training. I do have with me today Ms. Lee King, here to share more about the project. Welcome, Ms. Lee King. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and committee members. My name is Jasmine Lee King, and I'm a council member of the Hmong 18 Council. For the past 25 years, we've worked in partnership with our local cities and counties, state and federal agencies, as well as other organizations to serve our Hmong community. 
We have improved the lives of families through advocacy, providing culturally specific resources, family development workshops, bridging the gap between traditional Hmong culture practices and the American judicial system, and providing educational support for students through our college scholarships. This bonding bill for our Hmong Minnesota Community Center will allow us to have more capacity to serve the community and tackle the complexities of the community's current challenges. It will serve as a centrally located resource hub and satellite location for many organizations to provide <laughs> services to the community. Madam Chair and committee members, thank you for your consideration. Um, Ms. Lai King, do you have a, a site? Yes, we do. And where is that? Oh, in the handout. Our site is uh, located at 474 Minnehaha oh, Avenue West in St. Paul. Great. Thank you. And you mentioned something about acquisition. Um, have you already acquired it, or do you still need the funds to acquire it? Um, we still need the funds to require it. So you have like a, like a uh, tentative agreement? That is correct. Okay. Great. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you very much, and I appreciate all of you being here today. Thank you. I know Senator Pa is a great advocate for you. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Okay. Last three bills. Do you want to go take a picture? All right, because Senator Dibble could share. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, out in the hallway. Welcome to the other side of the table, Senator Pappas. We'll maybe pause a moment, let folks yeah. filter out. Oh, usually I have talking points. Okay, I Where have are my, my talking points? points? I think that's that your talking points. Oh, my talking yeah, points. Go. Here, capital campaign talking right. points. Mm -hmm. All right, yep. great. Here we go. So Go ahead, uh, Senator Pappas, Senate Files 674. 674. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, um, uh, Walker West, I don't even need them, is kind of this amazing decade-long um, facility that's been in my district, in the Rondo neighborhood, for I don't even know how long. And it's just like everyone in the neighborhood has taken music lessons there. And they have also have sponsored concerts. And during COVID, they were very creative in doing online concerts and kind of continuing their mission as much as they can. Um, so I'm going to actually turn it over to, um, to Braxton because um, he has a site already and he can tell us more about uh, what they're doing. All right. Thank you, Madam Chairman. And, and thanks, Welcome to the thank committee. You, uh, committee. I'm, I'm honored to be here today. I thought I'd just give you just kind of a... What's that? Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Braxton Hall, C, Executive Director of Walker West Music Academy. Like I, the other person said, I'm, uh, he, they were nervous. I am, too. Okay. <laughs> but I'm going to go for it. There's hardly anybody left here. <laughs> in front of. <laughs> uh, I thought I'd just give you a... Senator Nelson. Well, I was just going to tease Senator Pappas. There's not nobody here. You have very important people here, <laughs> right. Madam Chair. The important people are still here. You're right. Yeah. Correct. And just, yeah, pretend like you're performing in front of a, okay. a exclusive audience. There we go. All right, there we go. Piano. Yeah, I play piano. Um, I thought I'd just give you a quick update and just a, 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 a few uh, bullet points of uh, why this uh, project is so important. Um, I came to Walker West at, in 2018 at the tail end, and I immediately found out we had a non-renewable lease that expired in four years, which expires next year. Uh, at the same time, uh, we're in a 6,000 square foot facility. Uh, we have definitely outgrown the space. Um, we have doubled our enrollment from 150 to 300. Um, we have 180 students on our waiting list. Um, we have no parking, so when uh, the children get out of their cars, the bus flies by and it's kind of dangerous. Um, and so, 
uh, there is definitely a need. Um, right now, we have finished uh, and completed our design. We have contract bids. Um, we initially requested $5.4 million um, on a $10.4 million project. We've raised $1 million. Uh, we have $2.4 in a community asset transition loan, and we have $1.8 million pending. Uh, and that's kind of the state of where we're at right now. Um, I think many of you already know about Walker West, but I'll just kind of hit a, a few bullet points. Uh, we're a 35-year-old institution. Um, we're the oldest community music education school in the country started by black musicians. Again, we have 300 students, and with our ability to stream concerts now, we have 5,700 annual participants each year. Um, during the time that I've been here, we've had a strategic transformation. Uh, we used to just cover school-age kids. Now we have infants in an early childhood uh, program called Homies in Harmony, and then we have uh, elders in a dementia-friendly choir that is off the hook. It's called the Amazing Grace Chorus, and they're hitting the road and doing tours and everything, and they're wonderful. Um, and so um, we really uh, have this, this legacy and scope that's, uh, that, uh, you know, that has brought us to where we're at. Um, as we look at the building, um, I don't even want to call it a building. I want to call it a major community cultural destination and resource. And we're moving from 6,000 square feet to 16,000 square feet. It'll be state of the art, top audio vid, uh, visuals. We'll have two performance spaces. Um, we'll have plenty of education spaces, which we don't have, which is why we have the 180 uh, kids sitting on the waiting list. And music, what does music do? I think some people have already said it. It brings us joy when we do the concerts. When we stream them live, people told us stop doing, you know, you don't stop the concert series because we, we're in this pandemic and we need music more than ever now. Uh, obviously, it provides healing, health, and wellness. Um, it provides academic support. And I always tell people, uh, when I was a second grade, I was a D and F student. My mom enrolled me in the pianos and I went from D's and F's to an A's in a year. And so I'm a true believer that music uh, provides academic support. Um, career development, we're going to have a digital music production program and we're going to begin to start training uh, students to be audiovisual sound engineers and things of that sort. So it's more than just music lessons, we're actually looking at career developments. We have a connection with Hamlin University to get college credits and things of that sort. And then the thing that Reverend Walker would tell me I need to say, and I'm going to say it, crime prevention. Um, when the school was started in 1988, um, they started the school to get the kids off the street. And that was the beginning uh, flourishing of the crack cocaine epidemic in the Twin Cities. And they literally started that school to get the kids off the street. And so with the uptick in crime today, it's still more relevant than, than ever. Um, you know, definitely more relevant than ever. Um, Walker West has always been a community gathering space, not only for our concerts, we've had literacy, clinics, we've had food shelves, we've had a number of events. And then in 2021, uh, we were recognized by the Ford Foundation and the McKnight Foundation as a Cultural Treasure Award recipient, uh, which really showed our, uh, our impact on the Minnesota landscape over decades. Um, and that's the Walker West story. We're excited. Uh, we really are trying to broaden our reach. I mean, I got a call from St. Cloud Area School District the other day. And now we're working on a contract to help them enhance their music for their now Somali and African American students. Um, so with that said, uh, thank you for your consideration. I'm excited to be here. And this is, from my standpoint, it's all about community. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Halsey. And um, Madam Chair, I wanted to ask, to mention to Senator Dibble if, uh, I don't remember if you served with or you remember Representative Howard Ornstein. Oh. Um, well, I certainly know him very well, but I never did serve with him. Yes. Well, in his retirement, he took a violin lessons at Walker West. Yes, he's and in he's our adult ensemble. He's in your ensemble. Yep. He's quite accomplished. I plays often at my synagogue, our synagogue, too. Right. Senator Nelson. Oh, uh, thank, thank you, uh, Chair. 
Well, I would just note that there is a piano outside here, <laughs> outside these doors, that really needs to have the ivories dusted off. Really and it would here. be just awesome, I'm just suggesting, <laughs> as we walk out of here, if we could hear some of those great hymns, uh, or, or whatever you like to play. Okay, if it's so, in tune, I'll play you some total praise. I'd love to hear that. I'm going to be walking out that front door with okay. you. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Hussey, you have a location. Yes, we do. I'm sorry. Uh, 650 Marshall Avenue. It's the old uh, Wilder Foundation Center for Aging Adult Daycare. Um, that's where we're at. That's where, you know, and we're going to close on the, the purchase uh, in two weeks. Senator Nelson, reuse. Yeah, reuse. Yeah, right. Exactly. Right. Wonderful. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Okay. Appreciate Senator Pappas, Senate File 675. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, Senate Bill 675 is to support Listing House, which is a day shelter for people experiencing poverty, homelessness, and isolation. Anyone who stops by can find safety, hot cup of coffee, and a caring community helper just listen. Many who use Listing House's services experience multiple barriers to maintain housing, such as chronic physical and mental health conditions and substance abuse disorders. Listing House's services include showers with access to fresh clothes and laundry services, help with IDs and birth certificates, and a daytime space to rest with refreshments and lockers. And I have with me the Executive Director, Molly Jalman. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Pappas. And thank you, Chair. Uh, yeah, so thank you to the Capital Investment Committee for letting me talk. My name is Molly Jalman. I'm the Executive Director for Listening House of St. Paul. And I'm here to advocate for the approval of Senate Floor Bill 675. This bill provides a one-time $3 million cash allocation to Listening House for the physical construction of a new facility. It is in combination with uh, a structure that's already there. <laughs> Just going to add that in there since that's come up. Um, so we are reusing what's, what's there. Um, with these funds, we not only add value to a, an area that is very much in need of revitalization, this building has been sitting empty for over five years um, and not a lot going on in the neighborhood. Um, we offer the most basic, uh, practical, autonomous solutions for community members whom without this facility are forced to do very private things in very public places. Um, cities across the country obviously are looking for solutions to address the immediate needs of the poor and the unhoused. I'm aware of one public project that uh, it'll take two years, $1.7 million, and at the end they will have one restroom. With this $3 million, uh, it's six private restrooms, shower, laundry room, commercial kitchen, mini post office, storage space for documents and belongings, the list can go on and on. Um, most of all, we build a place for refuge for the isolated, lost, searching, and poor to connect with social, financial, and medical supports that are needed in order for people to move forward. Our pre-designed package has been approved by MMB, and we've met the match and full funding state grant requirements. Our board of directors were the first to donate um, we're shovel ready and prepared to be fully operational within months. Uh, with your support, Minnesotans will not have to go another winter without proper facilities to keep warm, safe, and clean. Um, Chair Paw, thank you for allowing me to address both you and the committee. Thanks for all the work you do for our state. I love Minnesota. If there is anything I can do to help get this proposal approved, please let me know, and I'm happy to take any questions. Ms. Joma, what's the total cost? 6.322. I checked with Jen. She nodded. Thank All you, right. Ms. Jama. Yes, Any of questions? Great. Thank Great. Thank you, right. you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Sorry. Wait. Oh. Wait. Oh, no, I don't have, I was just going to say um, I'm highly supportive of this. Of course, the work of Listening House is incredible, and um, Molly has been a, a key ally and uh, part of the coalition to address the whole continuum right. of, of housing and homelessness issues, and I used to be a volunteer there uh, a number oh. of years ago. Yeah, so uh, it's been I'm very 40 years. With the organization. Are you still operating your current location? Oh yeah, we haven't stopped operating. We're in the we're in a church basement. We've always sort of been in a church ba church yeah. basement, and uh, we need to stop being as transient as the people we serve. Um, we need to go deeper, not wider. Focus on how we deliver services rather than where, yeah. um, and that's what we're ready to do. So thank you. Thank you. So this project, it's been confusing to see where it fits in because there are these um, shelter appropriation bond programs out there somewhere that uh, the other body, Representative Knorr, is has been promoting. 
uh, but I've been having a hard time finding out where it fits in anywhere. So I think it kind of ended up in our lap, which is where it began. And I don't know, maybe if Molly or Jen has heard anything more about the there, shelter grants. There's no, uh, we're not adversarial to them. I sit on the strategy committee for uh, the Minnesota Coalition for the Homeless. I'm very much in favor of their Pathway Home Act. Um, they do amazing work. We're right there with them. We have to get this building built. Um, we've already acquired it. We're already, you know, doing things on the property. Um, and we I need to take, I need to put my oxygen mask on first for the people that we serve. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Next up, Senator Pappas, 2878. Save the best for last. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, you were almost last. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Madam Chair and members, I've been very pleased to work for a number of years with Keith Baker and the Reconnect Rondo project. Um, the vision is to become an admired national model for equitable development success known for leading a restorative movement in Minnesota um, with this project in particular. In, the goals are aligned to ensure equitable outcomes for African Americans and the Rondo neighborhood. This request would help fund the Rondo Innovation Campus, a new built environment for an innovative learning and community center. The campus will be located south of I-94 along Concordia Avenue with St. Paul College to the east and St. Paul Central High School to the west. Some of the features of the campus would be a green roof terrace, community resource center, Rondo Youth Leadership Center. The innovation campus would repair, restore, and revitalize Rondo and help reverse racial disparity gaps in Minnesota, and I couldn't get Senator Friends to fund this, so here it is in front of us. <laughs> I'll turn it over to Mr. Baker. Well, thank you Mr. very Baker. much, uh, Senator Pappas, and what a, what, what a wonderful introduction. I think you've <laughs> captured it all, so. But well, you sent me the talking notes. Oh, indeed. So thank you so much. Um, as, as you um, are aware, my name is Keith Baker. I'm the Executive Director <coughs> for Reconnect Rondo. I became the Executive Director in 2000. 19, but have been involved early on in talking with many of the elders as early as 2014 and descendants about this idea of creating an African American cultural enterprise district, which, excuse me, which would really rest over I-94. I'm really glad to be here and particularly to follow in part my uh, colleague and friend from Walker West Music Academy, because as you can imagine, uh, when um, Braxton had uh, indicated how long that music academy has been in the state of Minnesota, uh, it tells you the foundational um, uh, setting that is so important for us to recognize in terms of African Americans in the state of Minnesota and particularly in St. Paul. Um, what I really think is important to recognize is African Americans have been here in the city of St. Paul since the 1800s, mm -hmm. mid-1800s. Uh, and as you all already know the story, it was I-94, or the construction of I-94, that devastated the community. I wanted to kind of situate that in particular because what we're really dealing with is the past and the, the celebration of Rondo, but also the destruction of Rondo. Recognizing also, too, today, Rondo is a very diverse neighborhood. So while our project aims to create an African-American cultural enterprise district, we really recognize that it's quite a diverse community overall. How do we set conditions for the future really is the question. And I think the Rondo Innovation Campus really allows us to begin to look at that. When we think about uh, the Rondo scorecard that we had uh, done through our past prosperity study, what we recognize is that by 18 different indicators, the community of Rondo ranks net negative. Some indicators being education security, proximity to pollution, heat uh, island effect, health, water security, air quality, uh, financial security, and we can go on. So we recognize there's been a tremendous implication as a result of the freeway coming through, and that's the scorecard that we're dealing with at current. So as we think about all of the discussions that are going on around climate change, and all the things that we're talking about with respects to carbon reduction and those, uh, those uh, types of items, we have an opportunity to, to place the community of Rahner as a centerpiece. As you can imagine, we've got the capital or the Sears uh, uh, development 
site. We've got on the other side, Allianz Field. And there's so much development going on that if we are able to create the centerpiece of Rondo between those two bookends, we have a tremendous opportunity moving forward. As Senator Pappas had already mentioned, we've certainly got the wonderful resource of St. Paul College. We also have the wonderful resource of St. Paul uh, High School. Right directly across the street from the site in which we imagine this Rondo Innovation uh, campus is Maxfield School. And that's another extraordinary important uh, institution, not only a name, but a location as well. So we've got college, we've got elementary, and we've got high school, and certainly our middle schools as well. Can we create a process where we can introduce young people all the way through to this idea of innovation when it's all said and done. I also want to uh, just to indicate that we were successful in securing through the champion uh, work of Senator Tina Smith, 1.5 million. What we're looking for from the state is to match that at 1.5 million. The total cost is gonna range uh, from anywhere from 8 million to 15 million. We're uncertain about that right now as we're continuing to try to secure the relative sites that are there. We're probably one fourth, uh, I'm sorry, three fourths of the way securing all aspects of the site. We still have a couple of uh, sites that we're still having some discussion around uh, as well. So I just so appreciate the opportunity to speak before you. Know that Walker West Music Academy is one organization that we've been working very closely with. Others, St. Paul NAACP, uh, Taste of Rondo Barn Grill, Aurora St. Anthony Community, uh, Neighborhood Community Center, uh, Penumbra Theater, all of these are incredible assets in the community of Rondo. And we feel like a Rondo uh, Innovation Campus would be a tremendous opportunity to also display culture uh, and our history. So thank you so much for allowing me to speak with you here today. Thank you, Mr. Baker. Madam Chair. Any questions? Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, question for the one and a half million dollars that came through a federal earmark, is that money that you can use or would you need a match to be able to access that one and a half million? No, we don't need a match in order to access it. We're able to uh, apply. We've got to lay out what we think the application of the use of those resources to be and we haven't determined that just yet. We're hoping that when we um, have a few other dollars secure, we can strategically determine whether or not it's site acquisition or other uh, types of activities. Thank you, Mr. Baker. Yep, Senator Rasmussen. And I noticed in the bill language, the you know one and a half million dollars would be to evaluate potential sustainable technology, prepare environmental and community impact studies, and to pre-design and design the Rondo Innovation Campus in St. Paul. Would that could you help me understand how that fits in with the one and a half in federal funding and then the other number you gave, which was like eight to 15 million. I'm just trying to figure out what the different pots sure. should be used for. Well, we could use uh, simply the uh, 1.5 for just site acquisition. That's the federal money. So it does allow us to do that specifically. So that would mean that the 1.5 would shift and do some of the exploration around technology and exploration around uh, pre-development, pre-design and that activity. Thank you. The eight, the eight to fifteen million is just the total capital cost, depending upon the scale of the project itself. And Senator Rasmussen is correct. We would have to be more specific in the language if we decided to fund this in terms of what it would be used for. Mm -hmm. And if the federal money is more flexible, it might be better to use the state money for site acquisition. Uh, Anything else, Senator Rasmussen? All right. Thank you, Mr. Baker. Indeed. Right. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Senator Pappas. And you can. Well, if, is there anything else before us? Seeing nothing else, I call this meeting to adjournment. <laughs> <laughs>